It was the 12th of February, 2014. And I remember, I remember everything about that moment. Didn't think too much on it. I just thought it was normal being a, a mum of two little kids and working. My husband was sitting there on the bed. I walked into the bathroom and I had the phone to my ear and he said to me, okay, so we've got the results and it's definitely a lymphatic disorder. Now, I don't know what made me think. I said back to him, is that cancer? And then he said, yes. <laughs> oh, it was like a punch in the face. That's honestly how it felt. And I just stopped breathing. Since my cancer diagnosis, I guess my I've changed a lot. So uh, talking about myself before the cancer, um, to me, I was a completely different person. I was, a, well, I'm still a mum of two. I was a mum of two. Um, both my kids were under five, uh, happily married. Um, I was working as a mortgage broker in a family business. Uh, my father and I ran the business together. Um, and, you know, I thought my life was great. I thought, you know, everything was going fine, but it, you know, it wasn't until you, you get something like a cancer diagnosis that you realise, hang on, maybe life hasn't been so great and I haven't been so good to my body as what I thought I was. Yeah, but, but now things are, things are a lot different now and um, I'm happy to say a lot, a lot better. Nikki, I know there's a lot to share and let's go back to 2012. So 2012, you had just I think you just had a baby, right? You mentioned you were a mother of two, both under five. Bring us back to what those symptoms were shortly after that, um, that made you think, oh, okay, something's not quite right here. Mm -hmm. Well, it was, it was 2013, actually. I had my son in uh, April of 2013. And uh, I was, uh, you know, being a young mum, run off my feet, working full time, uh, I was experiencing a lot of fatigue, uh, which I thought was completely normal for somebody in my position. Um, and, and that was really all I can re remember experiencing before I noticed about 30 lumps all over my neck. And the way I can uh, explain it is it was like a corn cob. I um, was sitting in my office one day and uh, a colleague of mine mentioned that she often feels her neck for lumps. Um, just to, you know, be kept, just to be sure, uh, which is a really good, really good advice. So as you do, I, I felt my lump, felt my neck as well. And I sort of thought, oh, there's lots of lumps on my neck. I wonder what that means. And, and I wasn't instantly concerned. Um, I was, you know, I was, that, I was 31, I think, 31 or 32 at the time. I can't remember. It's that long ago. Um, but, you know, you feel a bit invincible at that time. And, uh, but, you know, I went along to the doctor anyway and, and said, you know, look, I've got all these lumps on my neck. And, and he said, well, we'll just take a blood test and I'll let you know if anything comes about that. And, and I didn't hear back from him. So I thought, okay, well, it was fine. And, and about six weeks later, I, I went to, back to the doctor, the GP. I took my son in. It was, wasn't even for myself, but I did mention to him, oh, by the way, I've still got those lumps on my neck. And, and the look on his face was a bit, oh, very concerned. Okay, so they shouldn't be there after all this time. I'm going to send you to get a fine needle aspiration, which I said, what is that? And he said, you're going to need a needle in your neck. And I was a bit terrified of that. <laughs> um, so I went in to get the test done and, and they said, oh, well, we don't do it that way. We ultrasound the neck and then we'll, we'll get you back in about six weeks' time and we'll compare the, the ultrasound, do another ultrasound and compare. And I thought, well, great, I don't, I don't want a needle in my neck, so I'll go along with that. So I did that and uh, about two weeks later I was at a friend's house and both of her parents are doctors and 
she called her parents in the room and said, look, Nikki's got these lumps on her neck. And at the time I did mention, I do have a lump in my groin. You know, I don't know what that means. And they all just looked at me and said, yeah, go back to the doctor now. So I did that. I went straight back to the GP and I said, okay, well, I found another lump in my groin. Apparently that's not great. So he said, okay, I'm going to send you straight to a hematologist. So it took me, well, first of all, the hematologist said he'll see me in April. And at this point it was, I think, December. <laughs> so I went back to my GP. Yeah, so I went to my GP and I said, oh, he said he can't see me till April. So he called him and said, no, we need to get Nikki in straight away. So he saw me. First of all, when your GP said, we need you to go, I'm going to send you to a hematologist to make an appointment. Did you know what a hematologist does? <laughs> and I mean, were you thinking anything at that point or like, where were you mentally? Were you thinking, ah, oh, this is probably just some infection. Like what was, or did you realize something might be deeper? Well, the, the GP did say to me, it could be non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I was a bit, oh, well, and I said, well, what's, is it better than Hodgkin's lymphoma? You know, a lot of people ask that and I, and I sort of got it in my head. Okay, well then that's the, that's probably the better one or, um, but I didn't really, it, I don't think it hit me. I, 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 to be honest, I thought I had glandular fever. I thought it was just something like that. And yeah, so I wasn't too worried at that, at that point. And I think maybe it was my age. I was a little bit carefree, I guess. Yeah. It was, it, it was kind of like, I just, I, that's your doctor. You're kind of going there. Were you like, I feel fine. Like, did you feel fine other than the lumps? I thought I felt fine. I was experiencing uh, the fatigue uh, that I, ha I have known to be in a bit low in iron. And to be honest, I can't remember at the time whether we checked my iron, but uh, didn't think too much. I just thought it was normal being a, a mum of two little kids and working. So, yeah, so I, I, he eventually got me into the hematologist within, I think it was two weeks. So so I went to see this hematologist um, he was like, he was all right. He was about in his eighties and he didn't have the best bedside manner. Um, but he said, uh, look, I'll send you back for that, that fine needle aspiration and um, we'll, we'll have a look and, and see what happens. So I went back, but the, we'll just ultrasound again. And before we do the fine needle aspiration. So they did that and they were, they were bigger. So they, it, I could, I noticed the change in their demeanor, like, all like, oh, you know, here we go. But then once they realised they were bigger, they were like, okay, let's get straight into this and get this biopsy. So I was uh, absolutely terrified. Um, I'd like to say that was the worst part of it all, but it wasn't. I, uh, But I did. I laid there. My husband stood by me the whole time. I was crying. And I remember the nurse saying to me, if you're tense, it's going to hurt. And... Um, and it was funny because I, when I was pregnant with my son, I practiced hypnobirthing where you learn how to sort of put yourself in a hypnotic state to deal with pain. And it didn't work for the birth. <laughs> but in that situation, my body, I automatically just went into this hypnotic state. And I mem remember vaguely hearing them talking, but everyone being a bit far away. And then I heard the nurse saying, is she awake? And and it, from that point on, it was easier because of, you know, I fully relaxed my body and we got through that and, and then it was a wagon game. So, and again, I wasn't that worried. I honestly thought I had glandular fever and I was going to, you know, get to have a bit of time off work and, and recover and go back to my life. It's so interesting already. And, you know, I'm less familiar, of course, with the system in Australia, but you, you have usually here, doctor says, you're going to this, if it's outpatient or, you know, another clinic, you're going to go there, you're going to get a biopsy. Yeah. And that, that surprised me as well, because I thought they had to do what the doctor said. And the doctor did originally say to do the fine needle aspiration. And if they'd done that, I would have been diagnosed a lot earlier. Um, not that it made a huge difference, but it could have, you know? Um, so yeah, I was very surprised at that. And, I, and see, I'm, I'm a private patient. I'm not a public patient. So I thought, you know, I'd get straight in and, you know, get diagnosed really quickly. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of people with follicular lymphoma, it does take a long time to, to diagnose. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, for me, it was it did take that that time, and even waiting for that the results of that biopsy. Uh, I remember calling the haematologist two weeks later and saying, mm, you know, should should we know by now? You know, I just wanted to know what's going on. And at the time, I'm thinking, oh well, you know, they would have called me if it was serious. You know, you have that thinking, like if they call me straight away, well, then it must be serious. But if they don't, then it mustn't be that bad. So I honestly, even then I wasn't thinking it was going to be any bad, but I thought I want to know, you know, if there's something, what's wrong with me. So about a week after the hematologist said, oh, I'll follow that up and make sure we get those results soon. It was the 12th of February, 2014. And I remember, I remember everything about that moment, you know, <laughs> everything around it was sort of a bit vague, but that moment I, I got a phone call. Um, my husband was sitting there on the bed. I walked into the bathroom and I had the phone to my ear and he said to me, okay, so we've got the results and it's definitely a lymphatic disorder. Now, I don't know what made me think. I said back to him, is that cancer? But I don't know what made me say that because when you, to me at the time, lymphatic disorder, ah, oh, well, it's some kind of disorder and, you know, we can sort it out and I'll be okay. But the words just tumbled out of my mouth, is this cancer? And then he said, yes. <laughs> oh, it was like a punch in the face. That's honestly how it felt. And I just stopped breathing. And he said to me, look, I want you to Google the word indolent. And I said to my husband, Google the word indolent. <laughs> and then I don't really uh, no, He said, I'll, I'll get you into see me and we'll work on, we'll get you to, to do some more tests and things like that. And um, so we hung up. And, and the reason it was a phone call and I didn't go in is because I, I actually live an hour south of Perth. I live in a place called Mandra. Um, so it was easier for him to call me, and which I didn't mind. I was happy with that. Um, so anyway, my, my husband then ran off, started Googling, and I just stood there stunned, like trying to process the information, I think. Like, okay, so this isn't glandular fever. This is cancer. And when you hear that word, everything runs through your mind at once. Like you don't know anything at that stage. And then <laughs> the funny thing happened, my, well, at the time it wasn't, my husband comes running back in and he says, he pulled my phone from me. He says, you're banned from the internet. You are not to Google anything. And then he just lost it. He, he cried his eyes out for I don't know how long. And I was supporting him like, it's okay. <laughs> we'll get through this. So he had his moment and he uh, instantly his mum came down because um, she's uh, she had uh, breast cancer, so she'd been through that, and we're, um, we're also very close. At the time, um, my mum was quite ill, and we couldn't, um, I couldn't even tell her. My mum has some um, mental health issues, so I couldn't tell my mum. So I, I heavily lent on my mother-in-law, and she came straight over, and we sat down and we spoke. And when my husband gathered himself and was able to be strong again, that's when I lost it. I just... Then, then he, it, it was sort of like we tag team <laughs> the support, like, okay, now I'm going to support you and surround you with love and whatever I need to do to get you through this. Yeah. So we processed the information well, until my appointment with the hematologist. My, it was, uh, it all seems a little bit of a blur at the moment, but I do remember thinking, okay, so for a few days, we, I was just stunned, but I wanted to make sure he was okay. And I think he, he read something and he still hasn't told me what he read. Uh, when, uh, you know, when, I mean, I don't, doctors don't usually tell you to go to Google. So uh, we were quite confused as to why he told us to Google that. But I, I, I do get what he was uh, meaning. So indolent means a slow growing cancer. And I think that's what he wanted to get across. But but my husband went a little bit too far maybe and read something that scared him a lot. So, um, so I think that's where he got very scared and had his moment. And then, and I didn't, I didn't Google. He told me not to Google. I didn't want to, to know anything at that time. So at that point I wasn't looking into things. I was just trying to process the information, trying to work out what, what I was in store for. I mean, you, you think chemo, hair loss, all 
all of that that you know you know or, and you also think am I going to be around for my kids that's you know am I going to meet my grandchildren and how long have I got and all those things run through your mind and it's you know it's it's devastating it but also completely changes your outlook on life it's uh yeah it's someone said to me at the time you know people who have had a cancer diagnosis there's there's something different about them uh I don't know whether it's a piece or something you know eventually but there's, there's they just look at life a bit differently and and I was experiencing that I was going through those motions of hang on I'm not so untouchable anymore uh before I was so happy to be normal and have no medical issues I used to go to the doctor and you know, say, I have no medical issues. I'm so happy about that. And then all of a sudden that completely changed. So it's it's a really hard thing to go through, but I think it was a very awakening moment for me. I can look back on it now and realise that it was probably something that I really needed to experience. You know, it took me a good, uh, I don't even know how long it took me to digest. I think um, it took me years to digest. I think because you go through those stages of, okay, so it's cancer. So then you, you you don't have much more information than that. And then you start going through the testing stage. So I had MRI, CT, PET scan, um, and, and then after all that I had a bone marrow um, extraction, which uh, was... Uh, I don't know how, I, the, my hematologist offered to do that in his office and I'm so glad I didn't. I said, no, I think I'm going to go to the hospital and just get get the good drugs and so it's, you know, as <laughs> less painful as possible because I had heard that it could be painful. What was the voice or what was it that pushed you to say, I'm not going to do that and to advocate your, for yourself and do you have a message for other people about how to do that? Yeah, I think when I asked the, the hematologist, what does this procedure involve? He said, okay, well, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to basically, he showed me the instrument. It was like a screwdriver or, you know, those, you know, those things that open a wine bottle. <laughs> and he said, I'm going to, I'm going to just drill that into your hip and we'll just take a sample of your bone marrow. I can do that right here, right now. And I was like, no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're not going to do that to me. And, and at the time, and this is actually one symptom that I forgot to mention before, I'd lost a, quite a bit of weight. Um, at, before, before I got the diagnosis, I was like, yeah, I'm losing weight. But at the time I was breastfeeding my son. So you can expect to lose a bit of weight when you're breastfeeding. So but I think by that time when he wanted to do that, I was very, I was quite skinny for, you know, I think I was in the low 50 kilos. And for me, that's really quite light. And I thought to myself, I, I don't, I just imagine myself being thrown around the room, <laughs> which funnily enough, when I did go into hospital and I did have the procedure done, that is basically what it felt like. Uh, but because I, uh, when I, well, when, when I, I'll tell you the story. When I got into the hospital, uh, it was uh, it was an evening, and um, I was expecting to go home that night because I had to get my kids to school the next day. My husband had to work, um, but they said to me, "You have a choice of two drugs. You can have this drug; it's the milder drug, but you can go home tonight, or you can have this drug, and it's stronger. Uh, you won't even feel a thing, uh, but you have to stay overnight in hospital." And I said, okay, well, I can't stay overnight because I've got to get my kids to school in the morning, um, but I want that stronger drug. How do I get that? <laughs> so, so they actually called the haematologist over and I said to him, please, I want the strong one. <laughs> I, I really think I need it. Uh, so in the end he said, yes, okay, but they said to my husband, make sure you guide her to the car and because I was going to be very woozy afterwards. and." Um, my experience of that turned out to be, I don't want to say pleasant, but it wasn't as bad as what uh, some people have experienced. Um, and I think that's because I advocated for myself. And, and Nikki, what was that treatment regimen that you underwent? Okay, so after I had the results back from the bone marrow, they they did find some juvenile cells in there, which determined that I was stage four. Um, and 
I then uh, was, we then had the conversation, you know, these are the, the treatment options, but the one that they recommended the most was a clinical trial that they were just coming to the end of. They'd been running for about 10 years and it was just coming towards the end. It was called hot Mabthera. So basically it was the uh, monoclonal antibody rituximab coupled with radioactive iodine-131. So the idea was that I would have quarterly infusions of rituximab for a year. And uh, then not long after my first infusion, I would be injected with the radioactive iodine and go under house arrest for 10 days. So I would have to be away from my family. Um, they had to approve where I was going to be staying. Uh, so I, I stayed with my auntie and uncle um, and bless them. My auntie, she's another one of my, my second mother's. Uh, she looked after me throughout that process. She took me to my um, to to get that that infusion and and then drove me home and and after I had the infusion, so they they put me in this chair and all left the room, gave me the infusion. And then they they said, okay, you can't be near anybody. I can't remember whether they said five meters or they said try and be within five meters of everybody. So we we took the stairs down out of the hospital and I was trying to be as far away from everyone as I could I sat in the very back corner of the car uh, we um, we had to have a, a physician come over and as I said check the place out and they gave my auntie and my uncle and even the dog uh, a badge to wear to um, sort of measure the amount of radiation that they were absorbing yeah uh, so I, I had to have my own bathroom facilities my own room as far away from them as possible uh, which was fine when I went to the toilet I had to flush twice at least um, and I just had to be very careful what I did I did two weeks um, only because I, I had two little kids and so the, the instructions were to to stay within five meters of mo most people but within a I had to stay away I think it was a hundred meters from children and pregnant women because their, their cells are very fast growing and the, the radioactive iodine destroys fast growing cells. So that was the idea behind that. So I said, okay, well, I'm gonna, let's make it two weeks because I didn't wanna risk any chances of, um, of that. The radioactive iodine is very well known to destroy the thyroid. So they did say to me, you will likely have thyroid issues for the rest of your life, but we will give you a tincture that will help for, to protect it um, during, you know, this infusion. Uh, so they gave me this tincture. I had to drink it every day uh, for about two weeks afterwards. And I, I had a scan uh, on the day of the infusion, then I had to go back. I can't remember if it was day eight or no, it was day eight. I went back for another scan, and you could see in the scan where it had protected my thyroid. Um, although I did forget to take that tincture one of the days, and I was a little worried that I ruined my thyroid. But funnily enough, I haven't uh, had any thyroid issues since the treatment. So, you know, getting a cancer diagnosis isn't the end. You know, for me, it was a it was a brand new beginning. It was an opportunity for me to renew myself um, or reinvent myself completely as a as a new person. And um, you know, it it, it was well, it's not doesn't have to be the end. It, it's a completely new beginning, and um, yeah, a, a, an amazing experience, and continues to be to this day. Thank you.